Thank you for joining us today for Digging for Truth. When the Israelites began conquering the Promised Land, the book of Joshua indicates that Canaan was controlled by a coalition of kings. In the 1880s, an archive of tablets was discovered in Amarna, Egypt. What can these tablets tell us about the land of Canaan and how do they relate to the biblical books of Joshua and the early chapters of Judges? Well, archaeologist Dr. Stra Scott Stripling joins us today from Katy, Texas from the Bible Seminary to help us better understand the Amarna letters. Scott, welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's good to see you. Hey, Henry, I'm excited to be with you today. All right. Well, uh, we're here today. We're going to talk about the Amarna letters. Uh, we're going to do mm -hmm. two, two episodes together because they're so important in terms of our understanding of the period I just described. But, you know, uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, let's, let's begin with the question for the audience, for someone who's not familiar, you know, uh, sort of when, where, and who uh, related to the Amarna letters. And I'll, I'll let you go ahead with that. Well, I'll just give you sort of a general overview. We have 382 tablets that were discovered at Tel El Amarna in Egypt, which of course was uh, Akhenaten's capital when he sort of centralized and created this, this new kingdom down in uh, Upper Egypt. And um, they were discovered accidentally, sort of like the Dead Sea Scrolls, and a lot of them ended up on the antiquities market. They were then gathered over several decades and um, all together we have about 382. They are clay tablets. They're written, written in cuneiform, and which is a type of Babylonian script, uh, sort of the uh, international language of correspondence at the time in the late Bronze Age. And they date to the 14th century BC. So if we are dating, as you and I would agree, the, the exodus to about 1446 and the beginning of the conquest to about 1406 and the end of the conquest around, you know, 1399 or thereabouts, the beginning of the 14th century, then <clears throat> these would date to about 1370 to 1340. So primarily in the reigns of Amenhotep III and Am Amenhotep IV which would be in Egypt's new kingdom. So when we talk about the new kingdom, we're talking about the 18th, 19th, and 20th uh, dynasties. Okay, so, so this archive, about 380 tablets, they're found in Egypt, um, but they originated from Canaan. So uh, the question is, of course, who wrote them? And we see in the letters actually who, who wrote them. People designate themselves. Let's talk about that a little bit, Scott. Okay, well, they're not all from Canaan. Um, we have 382, and maybe 41 of them are from further north in the Levant. So you have rulers in, in the, the north and in uh, Hatti and Hittite rulers and so forth that are sort of those northern Nahadim type, type rulers. And they're very different. Um, those are like brother to brother letters or yeah, Egypt is seen as kind of the first among equals with these guys, and the way they address each other <clears throat> is very, very different. Like uh, you have one example where one of the rulers is saying to to Pharaoh, I, you said you were going to send me your daughter in marriage, and you didn't do it, and I'm very disappointed, and this is going to hurt our relationship. You would never get that kind of confrontation in the, the Canaanite letters themselves. So let's just say that about 282 uh, 382 letters exist, and you have about 41 of them that are from these these uh, equal, if you will, brothers uh, of Pharaoh, and then we have the rest from the Canaanite city-states. Okay, so you're indicating that the nature of this correspondence from the Canaanite kings is quite different. The language is different. What they say is quite different. And when you read the translation of it, it's really fascinating. But I, I, won't, uh, I won't step on your toes with that. I want to let you uh, describe some of what we see in these letters. Uh, it, it's really fascinating. Well, there are a, a series of correspondence from these Canaanite client kings. Um, they are clearly paying tribute to Pharaoh. They point that out repeatedly. And they're not getting their, their protection. So Pharaoh is supposed to protect them. They're paying him tribute. These are his cities. They make it very clear. Uh, they are vassal kings, uh, rulers, mayors. It's really only the, the ruler of Hatsor that's called a king. The others, maybe we should call them mayors or, or rulers. And that's kind of consistent with what we read in the Bible as well, that the, the king of Hatsor was above the, the other kings. He was their chief. 
Um, but there, it's a series of complaints <laughs> from uh, these these Canaanite rulers to Pharaoh that he's not keeping up his end of the bargain, and they're being overrun by this these these uh, marauders known as Habiru. Now, I, I should point out that the language, while we say that that it's Akkadian, um, it's really a Canaanite dialect of Akkadian. So. It's not the the pure Akkadian that maybe you would get in those 41 letters from the brother to brother, but these is sort of a vulgarized version uh, of that, which is maybe what you would expect in the provinces. Yeah, and to help, help the audience with that, the Akkadian language goes back to probably 2000 BC or before that, and then it evolves over time, but it became the sort of lingua franca, kind of like the way that English is today. You know, when you and I go to sure. Israel, we're kind of, we're blessed that we don't have to we don't have to speak Hebrew, the common tongue there is English. Uh, and that's the common way that people talk to each other. So Akkadian is, is much the same way in that, but with this uh, Canaanite twist is what I hear you saying. That's right. All right, so, all right. so, so they're writing to the Pharaoh, they're complaining about the Habiru. Uh, what are the Habiru doing? Uh, what, what, is it mm. there, what is the issue going on there in, in the correspondence? Well, the, the Habiru, Apiru, you know, if you're uh, different, several ways of spelling it, but we'll just call them Habiru for now. They appear in the the literary record maybe in the 17th or 18th century BC, so it's not brand new to the late Bronze Age II period. Um, so the term can be a general term for marauders, brigands, if you will, uh, the dispossessed who are trying to get their share of the Robin Hoods of the day. But it becomes very specifically applied to these guys in Canaan at the time that the Bible says that the conquest was taking place. So at the beginning of the period of the judges, when they're continuing now after having gained a foothold to then uh, impress the conquest. And uh, these people uh, seem to match very, very closely the biblical Hebrews. And it would be a, a long thing to get into to talk about sort of the, the etymology of the word and what it might tie to. But not all Habiru are Hebrews, but I think all Hebrews are Habiru. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. I'll, I'll add this comment, and then we'll go to our break, Scott, and then, uh, and then we'll pick up in our next segment. But fundamentally, if, if you're a king in Canaan, and the Israelites have come into the land and they're trying to take over, what designation would you use to describe them? This is the term from the ancient Near East that one would use for, maybe a vandal would be a, a, a later sort of kind of mm. idea, right? Is that right. right about that? Yeah, and we have a similar term, shasu, the, like the shasu of Yahweh. So yeah. shasu can be a general sort of marauder, also like Habiru. But there are some Shasu who worship Yahweh, we know from the soul of hieroglyphs. So yes. these interesting, interesting terms, Shasu and Habiru, and then in the Bible you get the idea of the Giborim, like the mighty men, the mighty warriors. So this is a warrior class that seems to be dispossessed, but they're in the process of taking over. Right, and we, we think there's a, a great correlation with the Bible there. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. We're talking about the Amarna letters. Now, Scott, uh, we were sort of trying to start to make connections between these nefarious characters entering the land of Canaan, which the uh, kings or rulers are complaining about to Pharaoh, the Habiru. Um, but let's talk about another uh, aspect of the way that the political structure of Canaan is sort of described in the biblical text and in the Amarna letters, and I'll let you explain that. 
think of the American colonies uh, in the period of colonization. So these are our colonies, and they clearly belong to King George. Okay, so he is in charge, and it would be inaccurate to refer to Amer- Americans independently at that point. They're British. They're just British citizens that are part of the colonies. And that's how these city-states are. They are clearly under the hegemony of, of Egypt. Uh, they pay tribute to Egypt. They're loyal to Egypt. And we know it at a number of places, like at Bet Shean, we've got Egyptian fortresses that, that are there in that time period. So when we have Israelites entering the land around 1400 and encountering these Egyptian city-states, I think it's an error to, to think of them only as, as Canaanite city-states, maybe Canaanite Egyptian city-states. It's really a continuation of the battle that they had been fighting for a long time. Now, let me illustrate that for you. We have the the city-state of Shechem in the north, the city-state of Jerusalem in the south, and probably Hatzor and Megiddo would qualify as well. But we see a very different attitude at Shechem than we find at Jerusalem. So uh, Abdiheba, the king of Jerusalem, <clears throat> in uh, 285 to 290, is complaining vociferously, you know, that he's losing everything. Nobody else is loyal to Pharaoh except him. These people at Shechem in the city-state, they've all crossed over to the Habiru. They've allied themselves with them, and now Pharaoh's going to, going to lose all of his land. So that this interesting political divisions and petty bickering that you would expect, you know, if Pharaoh's in charge and now, you know, all the sort of commoners are bickering to him and giving him their point of view. Yeah, when they're when they're complaining too, it's interesting. In the one one letter, I can't remember which one it is. We'll we'll put that up for our for our audience. He calls the, his uh, his the other, other king a dog. He's like a hobby roo, mm-hmm. you know. So right. it's that it's that kind of thing that's going on between them. They're they're bickering, and the Israelites we think are the ones that are causing this disruption to the that's right. culture there. Yeah, I mean to be frank, I think the Israelites are the hobby roo. In, in this case, I think we have a direct synchronism between the 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 text and and what we find there. When you read the beginning of these letters, <laughs> I love the way that they um, self-deprecate. Um, I prostrate myself before the king seven times, seven times on my front, seven times on my back. I'm dust before your feet. Now, when the the emissary would deliver the letter, he would literally do that, Henry. He would he would lie before Pharaoh. He would roll over seven times from front to back as he's reciting this letter uh, yeah. before he delivered it. And we all we have are the letters from the Egyptian Canaanite city states. We don't have Pharaoh's response uh, in any of these. So either he was unwilling or unable, or the correspondence just simply didn't survive. And all we have, like in late Bronze Age Jerusalem, is one fragment that Elat Mazar found on the Ophel and published of either an archival copy or some sort of response that was in there. But the the letters 285 to 290 talk extensively about late Bronze Age Jerusalem, and we have no architecture. I mean, look in the city of David, no architecture from that time. You've got late Bronze Age pottery that's here and there, right? Uh, and then we have these letters. Henry, no one doubts that the Jerusalem was occupied in the late Bronze Age. Why? Because of the Amarna letters. Now, guess what? We we don't have evidence of Jerusalem being occupied in the intermediate Bronze Age, but the Bible says that it was. I'm talking right. about the Abraham narratives. Yet scholars would would be quick to say so. The the Bible's incorrect. So you see, the Amarna letters get the assumption of innocence, and the Bible has the assumption of guilt. Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent point. We see that methodological inconsistency uh, from our secular friends who are studying the Bible and its relationship to the archaeology, and we're pointing that out, Le- at least, at the very least, be, treat it in a consistent fashion. So, now, I wasn't going to ask you this, Scott, but maybe comment on, we, we don't, this is typical in the Bible, though, there's a lot of gaps. God doesn't tell us a lot of what's going on in the ancient Near East. Talk, it mentions nothing about Egypt's presence in Canaan. Um, but but the archaeology helps us to, to sort of draw a bigger mosaic of what's happening. Maybe comment on the absence of that and why that's not a problem. Yeah, the, it's really neat because the only new information we're getting about the Bible is from archaeology these days. So it helps us illuminate the text, whether it's artifact, uh, to something textual like the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Amarna letters. 
And, you know, it's interesting because that really amplifies the, the 14th century for us. And right after the conquest, or part of the conquest perhaps, we don't know really much about the 15th century and much about the 13th century. Uh, we don't really have texts that amplify that other than maybe the the accounts of victory battles, uh, like with Tutmosis the Third. But here you get an amplification and an illumination of the biblical world that's very valuable. Yeah, and, and so, you know, in terms of, we've talked, you and I have talked about this a lot about methodology, you know, mm-hmm. we take the biblical text very seriously and it has interpretive priority. But there's so much from the world of archaeology that just helps us understand it better. So it's not the key to understanding it, but it's so helpful for, and this is a kind of uh, situation that, that just speaks to that so well for us. Yeah, it really does. And not only that, but we find theological implications that are illuminated as well. Um, for example, the issue, the moral issue of the conquest, which is what some people have termed as, as genocide. Yeah, so let, let's let's talk about that some more in the next segment. We want to tell our, our audience, first of all, that Scott Lancer and I did a two-part episode on the sort of the theology, the ethics of that particular issue because of the killing of women and children in particular. Uh, and the judgment of God and His holiness and all that, but this Egyptian component is not in the biblical text. And your and your contention is uh, that this may be, you know, part of God's acting against Egypt. That's right. I mean, these city states are part of Egypt, and so what started in Egypt, it's not over yet. I mean, they yeah. have enslaved the Israelites. They've from the Hebrew children that were, um, you know, ordered to be killed by Pharaoh, and then the enslavement, and then the attempt of the Egyptian army to to slaughter them. Um, these people have sworn to kill the Israelites, and I think that gives a context to to the whole yes. concept. That's excellent, Scott. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We're here with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling, and we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. We're talking about the Amarna letters and their relationship to the book of Joshua and the early chapter of Judges. Now, Scott, we left off talking a little bit about this moral ethical question of the conquest. And you're suggesting something unique. I've I've not heard the suggestion before, to to be honest with you, that because these are Egyptian vassals, this could be seen as an extension of what God did against Pharaoh in Egypt. Maybe comment on that a little bit further, just build on that thought. Yeah, it's like the punishment on Pharaoh and on Egypt is continuing on the 18th dynasty because here, not only did he lose his military and his labor force, and not only did he suffer all of these ecological disasters and the death of his own son, but now you have the loss of his colonies. And when you lose your colonies, you're being dispossessed of your financial resources. <clears throat> so these these Egyptian Canaanite city states are are crossing over to the Habiru, and what we should read into that is financial disaster. Number one, and number two, just as Egypt was committed to slaughtering the Hebrews, these vassals must do the same thing. And so when the Israelites have a harem or an all-out war uh, with them, that's what's been declared on them. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. It helps sort of bring the bigger picture, like I said, mosaic of what's happening in the background here to help us understand it better. Maybe you could comment a little bit about, we didn't mention this, that the peak of Egypt's control over Canaan was in the reign of Tutmosis III, and we see sort of a a slow degradation of that. Maybe comment on that, because that's over a period of, 
I don't know, a century or so, perhaps? Well, I mean, Tutmosis the third, Tutmosis the third is the greatest of all the pharaohs. I mean, he, they they reach their height of power and control and influence. He has a very long reign, and uh, we have his victory stele at, at at Megiddo. So, in the 15th century, we clearly see that Pharaoh, this is 18th dynasty, goes in and conquers Canaan, subjugates them. They're all paying tribute, and we see the same thing in the 13th century. Ramesses the second is is a very powerful pharaoh. And we know that he does does the same thing. We don't have that sort of royal data in the 14th century, but what we have, I think, is even more valuable. We have this this Amarna, you know, correspondence, and so we see Egypt. They really don't have anywhere to go but down from Tutmosis the yeah. Third because he's he's about as as good as they come. But yeah, as you move through the subsequent reigns, then you see a, a gradual, not to say that the, the bottom has fallen out until maybe after Amenhotep II, you see a serious drop that takes place there. Um, I, I think that's an excellent picture. As is just, again, it gives us just a broader scope of what's happening there in, in, in terms of Egypt and all that's happening in the, in the political structure of what's, what's going on at this time. Um, Maybe let's move back a little bit to you mentioned earlier about the Egyptian garrisons in in mm. in, in Canaan. Uh, if I understand it right, most of them are in the lowlands, uh, and they're not mentioned again in the biblical text. And these are places mm. that the Israelites don't conquer, uh, like uh, you know Beth Shan you mentioned before, and a couple of other garrisons. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, they are, like at Jaffa, for example, you have uh, Egypt, very strong Egyptian influence there and temples and garrisons um, down on the coast. But the most interesting one to me is at Bet Shean, and because you know, visitors can go there today if they're able to climb the, the ancient hill <clears throat> and uh, visit you know, what, what was there. So the way I picture it is this, that if one of these vassal states was getting out of line, which clearly they're all out of line at at this point, through the Amarna letters, then there's a garrison station there that will go and, you know, pull them up short and collect tribute, conquer them, kill them, whatever needs to be done. Um, so Egypt has a presence in the Jordan Valley at Bet Shean. They've got a presence on the coast and probably other places too. <clears throat> now, we do get mentions of Egyptians in certain biblical passages, uh, sort of out of nowhere, you know, that this Egyptian was there. Um, and it did, probably didn't have to be explained back then because they all knew it. But for us, this is where archaeology really helps us flesh it out. Uh, how about uh, the, the, other, the other thought was, this, this has been discussed before too, like, like the cities that the Israelites actually conquer uh, such as I and Jericho, do we find tablets correspondence from those places or is that absent? Mm. And how, how would that fit with the record in your judgment? Yeah, well, we have Canaan, you're in the provinces, and so you're not going to get the type of literary output that you would in Mesopotamia or in Egypt, but you do get hints here and there. You have uh, fragments of cuneiform tablets at Hatzor, um, you have the one I mentioned earlier at Jerusalem, but again, just fragments um, yeah. the, uh, of these that survived. The ruins in, in Canaan, Israel, southern Levant, unfortunately, are not nearly as well preserved as they are in other parts of the ancient Near East. Yeah, that's good. Well, Scott, we're going to be we're running down to the end here. I'm going to give you a little bit over a minute, uh, you know, just to sort of summarize, wrap this all up for the audience, because obviously we could do multiple episodes. We're going to do a second one because we have a particular subject we want to talk about. But if you could if you could wrap it up for the audience and why this is why these letters are so important. Well, as we are excavating conquest sites, and that's really been the mission of ABR, we're focused on these sites from the period of the conquest and taking a regional approach. What we want to do is to take the material culture and any texts that can shed light on that as well. And this is all we've got, Henry. I mean, we, we have the Amarna letters. And what more could we ask for? Because we have hundreds of letters explaining real life situations that are going on in the land of the Bible at the time of the conquest. We've got real people's names and we've got places that are that are confirmed. We've got a verisimilitude even with terminology like um, what a footstool is. So we read in the Psalms that heaven is his throne, the earth is his footstool. You find that type of 
language in the Amarna letters. So it's very consistent with what you would expect to see at that time. Well, that's excellent, Scott. Uh, thank you for your insights on the subject. We're coming back for another episode, and we hope folks will join us. Thank you again. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your watching the program. We hope that this episode has helped you, and we hope that you'll join us for part two as we talk about the Amarna letters and an interesting connection possibly to the ABR excavations at Biblical Shiloh. Don't miss it. <laughs>